Hello everyone and welcome back. I had a nice bit of fun in the stream yesterday or at least developing the compiler again or the interpreter <laughs> sparked just a little bit of motivation in me again so I've been thinking about it yesterday and wanting to do a bit more so I said I'd get another maybe hour in this weekend. So just to recap, I forgot to do it at the start yesterday, but this is a stream about developing a programming language in Rust. The language that I'm developing at the moment is called Seed. It's going to serve as a somewhat prototype language for playing around with different programming language ideas and is also going to be the basis for a more specific language or rather a language with a more specific use case that I'm provisionally naming Ash, which aims to be a bash alternative with a more, I would say, familiar syntax to those coming from C style languages, but to try and keep up some of the other ergonomics that bash does do well. So that's kind of the intention of the project where it's at at the moment. I'm, I would say, 80% through the feature set of seed at the moment. Most of what I'm doing is porting code from a previous iteration of the implementation, but that implementation didn't have basically any tests to speak of. So I've been re-implementing it from somewhat from the ground up. A lot of it, the code has been copied over, but it's been enhanced with tests and proper error handling and nice rounding off of edges like that. So that's where the project is at the moment. And finally, the tools that I'm using to develop this are number one, I run my development environment on a remote server. So I, SF, I use Mosh to connect to that so that I get a stable connection. I use Tmux so that I have multiple sessions on the one host and I can disconnect and reconnect, which has been quite convenient. And I can just pick up where I left off, even if I shut down the computer. And then within my little programming window here, on the right hand side, I use a combination of mostly ENTR to rerun the test suite whenever there's a change in either the code base or the tests. On the left here, I use my programming environment, which is essentially raw Vim. I don't have the you know, Vim really set up. So it's, it's really just Vim with nerd tree. That's basically the, I would say the only plugin I use at the moment. And then on the bottom, I've just a little shell here that I use for running commands. So that's the project, that's the setup so far. And what I did yesterday was I had, for the most part, completed destructuring of objects and lists. So essentially creating and assigning new variables based on the contents of either objects or lists on the right hand side. And one thing that I wanted to start off with today, I had just a few extra test cases that I had thought of while I was doing a bit of exercise this morning. And I was thinking those would be nice to, to add. So the functionality shouldn't need to change. All these tests should just pass. And so let me see. So I'm going to be running just check. Now, I was thinking just as I was starting up as well. So I'm going to run check unit and it runs cargo test. I was wondering if I could basically skip the compilation step because I shouldn't re I should really only need to rerun tests here. I shouldn't in theory need to recompile the project. I guess Rust will be smart and only rerun the project or recompile the project 
if there are changes, we'll see how how long the compilation process is anyway. But the first test I want to add in here is a success test. And I think all of these tests are going to be, all the tests I'm going to be adding are on objects. So first was, yes, yeah, so for this object destruct renaming approach, one thing that I hadn't demonstrated, even though it's functionally viable, even though I'm not sure how, how I fully feel about it because I'm, I'm not really sure I see a, a use case for this. But if I say the var name is A, or rather the key name, if we use, or sorry, if we do it like that, then this should allow us to assign the value at the key B to the variable B. Now, personally, I really don't see a good use for this, but at the same time, I like the, shall we say, linguistic consistency that allows us to do this. Now, whether that's justification for actually including it in the language, I'm not so sure, but at the same time, this is more the research basis for other languages. If it's something that I want to cut out when I turn it into a more production level language, then that's also an option. But for the moment, I think it's nice to even just have it conceptually there. And while, yeah, it's compiling the whole thing. Not really sure why that's needed, especially since I don't think the actual source code changed. But anyway, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to add in maybe another error test. Okay, so that passed anyway. Now, having said that, I'm not sure did it actually include the new test? So let's just double check. Rename four. Yeah, so the new test ran and passed. So then the other tests that I wanted to do are object destruct. this as well because I think some of the test names use the word destruct and then others seem to use destructure so just for consistency there and what was the new test i think was this one object destruct dupe name so this isn't going to be allowed so if we do a a is equal to this that will be an error Oh, and this was actually one of the, the errors that I was going to check. So if we try to use a key that doesn't exist, so that's actually being handled already. I already have a test for that. And then, so we have destruct duplicate name. And we'll also try that with a rename. It'd be interesting to even just see what errors, what error messages we get back for these so far. Are they handled somewhat sensibly by the compiler? Or I keep saying compiler. Are they being handled sensibly by the interpreter at the moment? Or 
is it something that is might have a, a kind of a funny name or a typing name there but is it something that has a funny rendering at the moment if it's not being yeah again seems to be compiling i feel like i haven't touched any source code now it could be due to the fact that the tests are being generated by build.rs and so when build.rs runs maybe that maybe the generation of those tests is causing a recompile as well the compile at least is a little shorter than it sometimes is or that it can be at other times destruct on lists why did that fail this time did i oh yeah so that's just uh due to my rename <clears throat> okay and we do have it automatically being handled in fact that's a little surprising i thought that i hadn't added support just yet for catching that error but having said that this was code that i had written a while ago so before i took a bit of a break and so maybe i had actually implemented that correctly so I have names in binding. When does names in binding get updated? I guess if it gets updated in bind next. Ah, so it does. In bind next, it updates the names that have been bound so far. So I actually don't have to handle that based on the value type. as long as there is a set of bindings on the left hand side we'll get this check for free and in fact I'll, I'll, i was thinking i would only be doing object tests here but actually in, would make sense to test for lists as well because that can also occur with lists so first of all we have yeah it'll be the case in both situations in the two tests I think so a is bound multiple times in this binding and okay and that's actually the first time we encounter this type of error i feel because otherwise there would be other error messages in this test file for the same thing so that's kind of interesting so clearly i had been doing a bit of <laughs> coding for a future fe feature so i may have unless i added this just for objects but i'm not sure i might have been silently predicting the the future features since i had actually implemented this whole thing before as well anyway so that would make sense and where is okay so it actually calls it out for the second instance of the of the variable name which is quite cool I think I mean I'm pretty pleased with that and this would also be one five so yeah let's try that and I can go ahead and do a
And those are the new tests that I wanted to add. And so now we can continue on with the next potential feature, which is range indexing. Or will we do unspreading first? I guess. Rain. So I'll probably only be streaming for, let's see, maybe an hour today. Let's double check. Yeah. So maybe another 45 minutes or an hour. So in that case, I don't think it would make sense to start range indexing. I feel like it would take a bit of time. Now, having said that, the syntax is already there for range indexes. So maybe that isn't an issue, actually. I was thinking if range indexes didn't have an implementation yet at all it would be a lot of work to to write it from scratch but since i only need to implement the assignment portion of range indexing then that should be fine so let's go ahead and do that i feel like it's for whatever reason in my head it's a little bit more boring so yeah, I guess I'll just eat the frog. So in that case, looking at this as well, so I have range index here as an assignment, which makes sense. I don't quite know what I mean by range index here in destructuring. So I get it in the context of using it to assign to multiple indices or a range of indices at the same time. But for using a range index on its own on the left-hand side without a variable beside it or without an expression beside it, that doesn't make sense. I wonder, did I make a mistake there? So I'm going to remove that. And so let's see what the order for expressions is. Expression, raw expression, and range indexes go underneath indexes. So that would be bind, maybe underscore, or at least in that general area. Index range, I saw it there. At the moment, that wasn't implemented. Okay, so that's something that I'll actually have to implement from scratch, so to speak, or at least implement for the first time here. Now, let's see. So a range has a start and an end. Oh no, sorry. A range index has an expression, a start and an end. So we'll have to evaluate the expression, <clears throat> make sure that it's a list and also
then we will actually evaluate the, the bind. So let's see, this will be my first time probably implementing something or implementing a feature somewhat from scratch in a few months. So let's see how quickly I can get up to speed here. So we have a start. So where was this? No, it was AST had expression or range index. Start. <clears throat> Evaluate the expression. If it's a list, then we're good. So the expression is going to be the expression to the left of the actual range index operator. don't allow range indexing on objects for the moment. And this is going to be value not range index assignable. expression to index for the location. Mm, this will be not tricky, but there's a bit to do in it. I'll see if I've implemented that already though in mod for when range indexes are evaluated. Yeah, so we have some logic here to already all these bits. And now we get to the part of the, so so far we've been handling the left hand side. We need to start looking at the right hand side. to handle this in a new yeah so we have bind object here would it make sense to create bind range index because it will be a hefty enough block yeah I think so the gist of bind object, but we'll rename that to bind range index. And we'll have names of binding left hand side props. So in this case, it's going to be left hand side, left hand side items and right hand side items and bind type that's fine
Yeah, that's enough to get started on this anyway. Also need to take in this case the start and end. Mm, I could probably just. it in as a tuple. Not a fan of that approach but should be fine. So this is an object box expression I believe. Let's double check. Yeah. So essentially for each index, we're going to do this essentially. So for each index from start to end. So let's go back here and do our evaluation for start and end. Now we also need to make sure that the difference between start and end is the same size as the list on the right hand side. And we're also going to be evaluating the right hand side. Do we do that down here as well? So if we do bind an object pair, at what point do we actually evaluate? Do we do evaluation in bind next? No, by that stage, it, the right hand side is a val ref with source. And I guess so is the, the list is a value too. So by this stage, when we go into, let's see, our new bind range index, right hand side by this point should be a list. So it should already be evaluated. So we'll need to do that up above. In fact, I think actually that's what we've already done. So we don't need to do this match eval expression because we already have expression, but we will need to, and we don't need to match on the type of the value either because we already know it's a list. So we can go ahead and essentially focus on this block. So get list range index. And that will essentially evaluate the, the start and end index and then access it as a, a Rust range. So in that case,
we can do this. So we want to zero if we omitted the start and then we can do the same for end except end will be the length of right hand side on the left and right hand side. old-fashioned for loop I'm not sure if there is one in this project yet so it will be start to end so maybe that would be let I is equal to that I guess that's the syntax sure that the end is well the start and end are in bounds as well so if start is less than zero I'm not sure I check for that at the moment <clears throat> I 
yeah, maybe I'll just simplify it and do all the checks here, even though in a way it would be nicer. to have separate ca cases for a lot of them, but there should be enough detail in the error message to just figure out exactly what happened. So if start is greater than end. Or end is greater than RHS length. Then say range index out of bounds with start and end like that. Now we'll need to get the location of the left hand side as well. And then finally we are in a position to just do the assignments. Okay, let's try that. We haven't compiled it yet, or at least looked at the compilation yet. So let's see where we're at. Yeah, we're borrowing a few bits from mod. Now I'm not sure how best to import those in here. Let's see. So we'll do that. So far, I in that match expression in line one twenty. So those aren't the right hand side items, they're actually the left hand side items. Where do I get the right hand side items from? Right hand side is already evaluated. What do I do in object? Oh, I do a different operation instead of match val I do a match on the right hand side and make sure that it's a list evaluator functions and I'll also 
also want to do the same as I do in object where I pass in the location. I do that on a separate line at the moment. And I use that uh, once again redefine new location error. Not my favorite way of handling that, but it's <laughs> the approach I have so far, and so that should remove a chunk of errors as well so let's see where that gets us and I also need to remember to bump the version because this will be a new feature and I'll add a to do comment in features So here we have props, which is LHS props, which should be expressions as well. Yeah, a vector of prop items. And this is an expression. So we might need to actually evaluate that after all. tricky. Because we do want to also evaluate the right hand side too. Yeah, I guess things like indexes need to be evaluated first as well yeah so index gets evaluated first prop gets evaluated first so i'm going to need to do that here too which is going to really increase the indentation level but Should be all right. Oh yeah, I need to remove that. And so back here with range index, I am wanting to do a... Hi, welcome to the channel. I'm doing well, how are you? And 
so I'm wanting to make sure that I have a list here on the left hand side and so I can have LHS items here and this would be range index on non list I would guess I already have an error message for this somewhere. Let's see, we have range index. Oh, thanks for the question. So this is a, essentially a research programming language. So it's a language that's intended to be used as shall we say a stable base it's just going to have a bunch of fairly standard language features to start off with but then that base language can be used to play around with different language ideas that i've been kicking around things like languages where there's a big focus on nice error handling ergonomics or things like that in particular it's also going to be used as a basis for a follow-on programming language that I'm provisionally calling Ash, which aims to be a bash alternative that keeps the, what I'm calling the ergonomics of bash. So it still makes it quite easy to run programs and processes and tie them together quite smoothly, but then use a syntax that's maybe a bit more familiar to people coming from C style programming languages. So that's the gist of it. I'm kind of, I would say 80% done with this core language and then hopefully moving on to Ash in the, in the near future. All right. Um, <laughs> thanks. I, I guess I'll take that if I look at like a professor. And I would say that yes, to me, Bash has in my, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that you can, you can debate it, but to me, Bash is arguably the best ergonomics for running programs and running processes, because if you think about it, so if I were to just pull up a, a new window here or something, if I want to run the program ls and see the output of it, most general purpose programming languages that you use will need to, for example, if I took Python, which is quite lightweight, I would still need to do import. I can't remember the exact uh, commands, but you'd have something like popen ls, you grab the output here and then you kind of process the results and yeah absolutely so so traps and signals are are exactly so those are kind of when i can when i mentioned the ergonomics i'm kind of talking about that core functionality where we just run ls we give it the parameters and we get immediate output or we're chaining things in the way that bash expects so bash generally expects okay you'll have one stream of output and you'll feed it to another process that will process it a bit and then it'll feed it into another and if everything's changed together nicely and there are no errors then everyone work everything works fairly smoothly but then if you get into things like traps or redirecting different outputs from different or different streams from different processes into different places and having a bit more complexity in the order of execution and conditional execution, then the ergonomics somewhat fall apart to a certain extent. There can be ways to work around them, but at a certain point, you're kind of working against the language to a certain degree. And so, yeah, that's the idea of the language I'm developing to number one, make the try and keep a little bit of the ergonomics that bash does 
but have more consistency around what BASH tends to regard as edge cases and make those a little easier to use. Hopefully it's the intention anyway. And dropping frames, maybe uh, from my end, it's looking okay. At least the OBS uh, output for me is, is green at the moment. I don't have a huge understanding of, of these kind of things. So there could be frames being dropped somewhere. I'm not quite sure. I have had issues in the past with, with connection in my area being a little bit patchy. It looks okay today, but yeah, <laughs> let me know and I'll see if I can, I can improve things after the stream. I'm not quite sure how to, how to correct them here, but uh, thanks for flagging it anyway. So getting back into it, let's see, do we have an error for when we try to perform a range index operation on something that isn't a list. So we have range index here. And if we jump to the end, value not range indexable. So value not range indexable. Now we have a few different ways that these are getting termed. Although, yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to worry about it unduly. Now, it's kind of strange that I'm not including the value there. I'll just add it as a comment. Yeah, so that should be fine. And we have now our LHS items. I think we're still going to want to do this match on the right hand side. And I guess we'll do that before we call the function, even though, like I say, it really gets the nesting level quite deep here. But I feel like that just kind of happens with Rust, at least the way I do Rust anyway. Uh, can add a doc called stats. Oh, thanks for the tip. And now that you mentioned it, what I'll do is I'll do a little screen grab of your message there. I'll look into it earlier. Thanks for the thanks for the feedback. So with that said, let's see, we have our left hand side list now as well. We have the right hand side list as well. So First we have the value is not range indexable. If we try to perform a range index assignment, that's something different though. And so then we have this new error value, not range index assignable. Does that make sense? Maybe we can rename this range index assign on non list. Yeah, and I think that maybe makes things a little more consistent in terms of the naming that at least I'm expecting in my head. So it, it gets a little little tricky when there are so many different conditions to handle. Rust analyzer. Pro I'm using, I'm using Clippy and I'm using, let's see my just file. So I'm using Clippy anyway. I don't think I'm using Rust analyzer at least I don't remember exactly what Rust Analyzer is. So I'm a bit of a, a novice when it comes to Rust anyway. I'm not, I, I really don't keep up to date with the, with the ecosystem and things. So there might be best practices that I'm, I'm leaving out here for the moment. So, but 
yeah, that's something else I should be should be checking out as well. And so with that, we have just about enough information to call bind range index at this point, I think. So let's go ahead and save that and see where we are with regards to the errors. Yeah, so I've done something silly with the parentheses here, it looks like. So I've got my match. Got my value. I don't quite see where the, oh, I should have a, yeah. I think that's all that is. I was missing an ending parentheses. One, two, eight, so. We're expecting list, a vector of list items for the left hand side here. But we got a mutable, mutable vector of val ref sources. Now, I thought that list items were R. Oh no, there's something slightly different, are they? So then prop item, I guess, is the same setup. So what do I do here? are straightforward enough to, to resolve, even though such a messy parameter list. Not loving this range index implementation, but it is what it is. So on the left-hand side, I'm wanting my vector of list items and when I get to here I have my value list so that's AST so that's not the that's for expressions I need to look at the values and a list okay so it shouldn't be list items it would be a vector of valref with source. So that would mean so here I'm taking the evaluated list items or at least that's how it's written so far but in bind object I'm actually taking unevaluated values, so expressions. So that means I need, I must be evaluating them in this, in this block. And that's because, yeah, I'm not, really evaluating the left hand side although sometimes I do so if it's a for example a pair okay so I do evaluate expression to string on the the left hand side here so in that way bind object is actually taking the unevaluated expressions from the the left hand side so do I want to or how is that going to work with the with range index will I do 
evaluate left hand side to evaluate left hand side to list how am I handling that in mod in the evaluation section so range index So you can't, so compared to here, you can't do a range index assignment to a string because we're going to keep strings immutable. You can do it on lists. Hmm. Yeah, so I evaluate list left hand side items. I guess I'll just update this to be a, a list. So rather than taking a vector of list items, which are expressions, even though that's not very clear from the types because I'm not prefixing, I have when I'm importing them, I remove the prefix. So if I had, for example, value colon colon list versus I would say AST colon colon list, it might make it a little clearer. And I've got these expressions here. So should I take them all as expressions and then evaluate? The expression in here as well and then I can reduce the, the what's it called <laughs> the indentation level yeah I think I'll do that now I won't really need to oh what's going on there i can reduce it by one oh yeah and so expression to string do I want to use something similar can I do eval expression to list no that doesn't exist so I guess I'll just Little 
bit of a messy function, but it is doing a lot of things. Let's see how we are now in terms of errors. Yeah, I feel like the unspread operator would have been <laughs> more straightforward. Variant not found, that's all fine. Expected and arc found a reference. If that's if that's all the errors that are left over, that's kind of good. So expected a struct an arc struct on the right hand side at the moment. Okay, so the way this will actually have to work is I will have to get the zero to left hand side length start plus i will go to right hand side i. This is quite, quite a like not a difficult feature but it's quite a complicated feature in its own right item mismatch Strictly, it should be rain. Well, indexes versus indices. Mm, complicated. There's like the stuff that's arguably correct, but then sometimes consistency 
to me feels a little more valuable but end of the day these are only little things and possibly better to make just a decision might not always be the right decision but just something to keep you going and not get hung up on the little details which <laughs> i tend to get quite hung up on so anything that breaks the analysis paralysis is probably a good thing in general just to get stuff done I could potentially go ahead and get some, let's see. Yeah, I could go ahead and maybe do a little bit of work on tests. Oh, there is some lifetime issues, I'm guessing. So let's take a look. First of all, I will Add a new test just to have something ready for when, if and when <laughs> the compile does start succeeding. So let's see range index sign. We'll have x's is equal to one, two, three. Now the right hand side could be a string, even though I've only allowed it to be a list at the moment. So maybe that's something to change shortly. A, B, C, print X's and that should print pretty highlights the the fact that the language allows for heterogeneous lists but yeah that's just the way it is and then x is if i were to do abc would get the same output here and then i'll add some error test later as well so in the meantime let's see what we can do about these lifetime issues and those variables aren't being used so yeah we can get rid of those and that's not really binding range indexes that's more uh i'll still call it bind <laughs> for consist uh, <laughs> for consistency with the fact that the overall function is called bind yeah fine i'll leave it as is and so we've got an issue in which macro invocation okay so we can't really just keep access to this maybe i will put this in the in the overall call then and that's for the left hand side so the left hand side is always going to actually be a list so that's fine 
Now, the right-hand side, as I mentioned. Okay, I'm going to start with saying that it can only be a list just to simplify the initial implementation, but in a follow-on, I'll go ahead and open my scratch file, range index. list right hand side and string right hand side so that's that and those are I think generally to do with the same thing and this is a move we can do a clone because they're all arc refs anyway and so that will clone the reference so if it's an object in both places both objects will be referring to the same thing now there should probably be a test to verify that So if I do let's see, this is kinda tricky, but let's see how we go. I'll need a lot of error tests for these as well. expression we will have a vector even though we have expressions here over here we have a vector of val reference source I think or it would just be a list I believe and so instead of expression here we will have expression there and left hand side items. Ok, 
Okay, getting a little tight on time here. But I'm really wanting to see this finished out. Or at least get a successful compilation once I get to the the testing then I'll put on a bit of a pause but I do want to see this compilation succeed at least once today I need the dopamine so let's see match that that doesn't need that and one four six yeah there we go Just some syntax errors. looks looking promising maybe this will resolve both those issues well I need to update this to be Actually, I'm not fully sure why it's neat, why it's requesting the mutability So cannot borrow it as mutable because it's behind an ampersand reference and that's needed for, okay, <laughs> now I know why it's needing the mutability. So when I'm up here, I evaluate it to items so I guess at this point LHS items is also mutable so then let's try that but maybe I need to add it there as well I'm not sure an unused variable there. Let's take a look at that. That's looking promising.
Yes. Nice. And the test failed, but that's all fine. So the first of these is that what? Let's take a look. So we first range index reference, and that's just saying that A is not defined yet. So that needs to be a string, and that needs to be a string. And that should resolve that. And then for the second one, range one four is outside the list bands. Yeah, <laughs> even already that doesn't give me quite as much information as I would hope. So, so we go, let's see, range start out of list bounds, range start. At least I got the, the compile finished anyway. So I'm going to leave that there. So a recap of today, got a few little extra tests done for the object destructuring and list destructuring, got those committed and could push those, but I'll leave it for the moment. And got a chunk of the way through the implementation of range index assignments, which is a finicky feature at the moment. I'm not quite sure why I'm, why I'm including it, to be honest, now that I think of it. But nice to just have it to kind of round out the language in terms of, I don't know, it scratches a little consistency itch that I have so consistency and uniformity anyway so yeah with that said thanks everyone for watching as always and see you again next time take care have a good one